is good. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning for the reading of God's word? 2 Kings chapter 18. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snakes Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. For he held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. This is the word of God. Please be seated. Thank you, man. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth. As we refocus uh, into God's Word today, my challenge is that we really focus in on who Christ is. I'm going to invite my brother in Christ, Randy Hecker, to come up. Randy and I got to spend a lot of time together over a four year period. I met with him once a month. Uh, He was a mentor and a friend. We've known each other for many years. And uh, one of the things that I really got from Randy's ministry in my life was in the midst of ministry and all the gears that have to keep turning here was to refocus upon the reality of Christ and who Christ is. And it's taken a lot of time to get through my thick head. So let me pray with you. Father God, I thank you for my dear brother. I thank you for his life is meant to me and to many others. I pray now through the power of the Holy Spirit that your unction would come over him and over our congregation, that we'd refocus and that you would lead us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jerry, I don't know how I feel about this today. These terms that I'm hearing used, pastoral search team and (laughs) retirement and, you know, I've been connected with uh, East Richland Friends Church for a lot of years, and um, so I uh, think that, you know, throughout the eastern region of Evangelical Friends, Jerry is kind of synonymous with East Richland Friends Church, and so anyway, the the silver lining is I invite you to enjoy retirement. I've been there a couple of years myself, and it's not the time to quit, it's just the time to slow down and redirect for what God wants to do fresh and new in your life and ministry. And I value your friendship and your ministry, Jerry. Thank you. This morning I'd like to talk about uh, one of your favorite topics, idols. (laughs) You know, in the idols, in the Old Testament, idols were common. But for God's people, they were the kiss of death. Today, like so many other words and concepts that we have brought up with us through history, we tend to neutralize and familiarize and even glorify the term. Now today we talk about American Idol, you know, that old show, TV, or I idolize this person. We idolize celebrities. You got any Swift, uh, Swifties here today? You know? My grandson idolizes Stephen Kwan of the Cleveland Guardians, and I don't know if that is good or bad. Does he want to act more like Stephen Kwan or live more like Jesus? You see, we've become oblivious, I think, in our culture, especially in the body of Christ, to what God has refused to tolerate among his people. Right out of the gate, God says, no other gods before me. I am your God. 
No other gods before me. No replacements, no images. Because I don't want you to think less of me than I truly am. And you'll never grasp who I truly am. But I don't want it polluted. I don't want your image of me polluted because that will affect how you worship. And what you worship and how you worship will dictate almost everything else in our lives. Back in the 90s, and I've confessed this publicly, I confess it again to you today, my idol was the Cleveland Indians. My day started and ended with the Cleveland Indians. If I wasn't watching them on TV, I was listening to them on the radio. They became a part of every conversation I had, whether it was at the church or in how, at my home or out on the street with neighbors or what, whatever the case might be. It was always the Cleveland Indians. And I never intended that to be. It just happened. And I had to check my soul that the Cleveland Indians was gathering more momentum and more significance and should be given. Because um, as any idol, it tends to work its way up my priority list, oh, so subtly, until it begins to challenge God's rightful place. And it doesn't mean we get rid of them. It just means we get them back into balance. And sometimes we have to go so far as to destroy them. You see, uh, good things gone bad, idols, are all around us. Things that start out innocently enough and harmless that begin to morph and change as I feed them oxygen and, f and give them mo too much attention. They begin to become toxic to my soul because, like I said before, they challenge God in His rightful place in my life. And that's not, it's, it's not because God has an inferiority complex that he wants no graven images of himself. But it's the things that we elevate to challenge him or to be equal or more than him, it hurts us. And he loves us so much, he wants his best for us, and our idols keep us from his best and distract us to other things that don't deserve that place. That's what's so dangerous about idolatry in the Old Testament and for us today. These good things that can become bad could be a hobby, could be a pastime, could be a career. It could be a celebrity, a sports team. It could be a Republican or Democrat ideology. It could become an ideology in general, such as what's happening in Israel right now, where an ideology has been deified that justifies the killing of innocent civilians. It could be a cell phone, a device, a screen, the Internet. It could be finances, the stock market, even a person like a child. Sometimes it's just stuff. I remember reading about a guy that uh, he grew to idolize the finer things in life. One day he walked into a BMW dealership and he bought the brand new, the best looking car, the most expensive car on the showroom floor. Unfortunately, he also thought he owned the road because when he pulled out of the parking lot in his new car, wham, he got broadsided by another car. As he climbed out of his car, he screamed at the other driver, look what you've done to my beautiful new car. And then he looked down and he saw his clothes and he said, look what you've done to my Armani suit. It's torn. And the other driver approaches him and says, you know, buddy, you are so full of the material things in life that you haven't even noticed that your left arm has been severed. <laughs> And the rich man looked down and he sees his left arm is missing and he yells, my Rolex is gone. <laughs> Sometimes it's just stuff, but once upon a time, it was a snake 
from the nation of Israel or Judah. A snake. Now, this historically speaking, we go back 3,000 years. A young king by the name of Hezekiah, 25 years old, comes to the throne of Judah and he encounters this phenomenon. Something good that's gone bad. A good thing initially, but over time, it morphed and became a bad thing. 2 Kings chapter 18 features a young man, 25 years old. You remember in your Old Testament history that after Solomon, the kingdom of Israel divided into two. Ten tribes to the north became Israel. Two tribes to the south became Judah. And it was this southern kingdom that Hezekiah came to rule. His father's name was Ahaz. And Ahaz's life and ministry was a train wreck. And it was driving the country crazy. And so those of his inner cabinet decided to create a a, a co-regency. Let's elevate and promote Hezekiah, the son, into a co-regency to balance out Ahaz. So Ahaz becomes a, a king emeritus, if you will, and then Hezekiah comes to run the show in day-to-day operations. Hezekiah walked into his position. And this is a little bit of what he found. I mean, he had his hands full from the first day. Economically, the country was in a recession or a depression. They were in an alliance with Syria where they had to pay the money for protection and and borrowed money from them to make ends meet. They not only were broke, but they were in debt to Syria. Militarily, Judah had a papier-mâché army. They couldn't even protect the the villages and towns in their own region. Spiritually and morally, it was a cesspool. Hezekiah decided to take control of matters and make a difference. And so... His executive order was to address sin in the camp. You see, sin that had become a part of their religion. You see, people worshipped God, but they allowed some things to be borrowed from pagan religions around them and brought in and synthesized with their worship of God. So it kind of became a, a smorgasbord, if you will. Sort of like what happens today where we pick and choose what we're going to believe and value. The mindset of, the, of those people in Judah was, hey, i got to cover all my bases. I mean, what can it hurt? If God is asleep at the wheel, maybe one of these lesser gods can fill in. And so Judah's religion became a religion of convenience. Altars had been set up all over the place. So that wherever you lived and you needed to worship and sacrifice, you could very easily get to an altar. They were all over the place, sort of like McDonald's and Family Dollar or whatever else. Very local, very convenient. And Hezekiah had them destroyed. He also destroyed the sacred pillars. These were the way that... They promoted prosperity religion in the Old Testament, ancient world. You see, it was like a business venture. If I sacrificed and worshipped at a pillar, I consulted a god in hopes that he'd turn me a prophet, like give me a good harvest or make things go well for me, like help my favorite sports team win. (laughs) And And then he turned on the Asherah poles. He went for a clean sweep. He went for it all. Asherah poles were erected to Canaanite goddesses. They were fertility goddesses. And these were the places where all kinds of sexual immorality took place as worship. And Hezekiah destroyed them. But he wasn't finished. And this is where the snake comes in. The text says that he destroyed the snake at the temple in Jerusalem. You see, this used to be a good snake. 
because it was God's snake. This good old snake had been around for a while, going back 700 years. Rewind with me to Numbers chapter 21, where it tells the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt, being delivered from slavery. And as soon as they crossed the river and came into the wilderness, they complained. They whined. They griped. Yeah, their bodies were in the wilderness in Sinai, but their minds and their hearts were back in Egypt. And they griped about Moses, and they didn't like his leadership for bringing them out to this godforsaken wilderness. They complained about the wilderness. They complained about the food. All they had was manna. How many ways can you cook manna? How many times can you serve manna? They got sick of it, and they whined, and they complained, and they fussed. And they just wouldn't let up. Sometimes like those kids in the back seat that on a trip say, when are we going to get there? (laughs) And they kept at it, and they kept at it, and God got fed up with it. And he did something for an attitude adjustment. He sent vipers into their midst, poisonous snakes that bit the people. And some of those bites were fatal. People died. And the Israelites got the message real quick. And they ran to Moses, who they just complained about. and said, do something, Moses. We can't handle these snakes anymore. And so God said to Moses, you put up a tall pole. And on top of that pole, you mount a bronze snake. And any of the people who have been bitten look at that snake they'll be healed and they will live it was a good snake huh yeah a very good snake at least at the beginning and after the people recovered from this incident and got back on their feet again they broke camp to head for their next destination Now go with me for a moment in your mind and imagine with me some of the conversations that were going on. Somebody stepped up and said, you know, what happened that day with those vipers and that bronze snake, that was a defining moment. We need to remember this. So we need to take down that snake and we need to wrap it up in bubble wrap and put it in a box and carry it with us. I mean, we... (laughs) And so they did. They lugged that thing around for 40 years in the wilderness. And when that group of people who were lugging it around for 40 years began to die off they passed it on to the young people and the young people are the ones that took it into the promised land under Moses or under Joshua and that snake was saved it was kept safe through battles and through those turbulent times of the judges And 500 years later, when Solomon built the temple, that old bronze snake was taken out of storage and put into the temple. That snake used to be an object of redemption. Then it became an object lesson for reminding the people of how God had worked in the past. And then something happened. The people began to light incense to that snake. And they began to worship it. And they gave it significance and control and power it was never intended to have. It had been an object of God's redemption, how he worked with his people. It was a reminder of how God had worked among his people. But then it became an object of worship an idol and something good went terribly terribly bad and Hezekiah the 25 year old king came along and he tore it down and he broke it into pieces good things gone bad through the ages now as we all know 
Times change, but people don't. You know when Hezekiah did this, he took a dive in the polls. There were almost certainly folks in the crowd who cried when they saw that snake laying in a pile of pieces on the ground. They cried. And then they cried out for his impeachment. <laughs> a bronze snake committee emerged and drafted a petition to get rid of the king, Hezekiah. You know some folks would rather have kept the snake and got rid of the king than to keep the king and get rid of the snake. But God was going to do something new. And when something good goes bad, like an old bronze snake, the only thing to do is tear it down, break it into pieces, and destroy it. You see, God or idols have a reputation for getting in the way when God wants to do something new. Because he often chooses new forms. God wants the best for us. But idols have a way of getting in the way. But we're not finished yet, are we? No, no. You see, this story isn't unique to Old Testament times. In fact, when we look through history, good things gone bad, good old snakes gone bad, just keep slithering into the people of God. S-O-S-D-D, -D, same old stuff, different day. <laughs> it's the story of civilization. Like that old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. The Pharisees, they're always painted as the bad guys, the ones that wear the black hats. But they started out as a good thing. They were good old snakes. They emerged during Ezra's time, and they were lay people. And their passion and goal was to bring righteousness to the nation and apply God's word and commandments to everyday lives and details for people in their lives. It was a good thing. They were so eager and passionate about applications that they tried to apply the law to every single situation in life, like washing and eating and Sabbath-keeping, dotting the I's, crossing the T's in detail. That's how they measured holiness and righteousness. Well, at first you can't fault them for that. They had good intentions, but then over time, Sure enough, Jesus showed up and his disciples, and they didn't comply with these new rules. And the Pharisees couldn't handle it, and they attacked him. That good old snake had become a bad snake. That old snake had become more important than God, and ultimately it was for things like that that put Jesus on the cross. Be careful when you mess with people's idols. <laughs> well, they won't call them that, but that's what they are. You see, when folks get into good things gone bad, because those good things become more important than God, they don't really care what God is doing or what He wants to do. And their attitude, if not verbalized, is certainly expressed, you leave my snake alone. It's not hurting anybody, not hurting you. Well, we jump ahead to the early church. They faced it. No sooner did Jesus ascend that Christians began to worship. And as they worshiped, as was their custom, they began to worship on Sunday night, or Saturday night, excuse me. That was their seventh day, their Sabbath. And then some Christians came along and said, you know, Sabbath is okay, on Sunday or Saturday night, but Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Wouldn't it be more appropriate for us to worship on the first day of the week, Sunday night, as opposed to Saturday night, the seventh day? But those folks who kept the Sabbath on the seventh day, which was a good thing, a good snake, became very upset with the changing of this day. And Romans 14 gives us a hint that the church in Rome almost became unraveled over this. 
because they've started fussing at each other. No, 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 the right time to worship is Saturday night, the seventh day. And others said, no, 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 let's do it Sunday night, the first day of the week. And Paul says, you know, it really doesn't matter. It's the principle of worship and Sabbath. And it can be done on any given day of the week for that matter. Well, we, we go to Galatians, and there was this group that emerged called Judaizers, and they just wouldn't let these new Christians change. They kept attaching to salvation by faith and grace. They had to, you still got to be circumcised. You, you still got to follow the law. You still got to do, you know. And they kept attaching all this stuff to salvation. They just wouldn't let it alone. In the next century, the church decided not to meet on Sunday evenings any longer. They moved it to Sunday morning. And a significant part of their worship was singing. They sang the psalms. They chanted the psalms. And they chanted um, snippets of, of New Testament letters that had been written, like Philippians 2 and Colossians 1 of Jesus. And those were their hymns. Somebody came along one day and said, you know, hey, I've got a new song. It doesn't quite chant the way we've been doing it. It's Greek meter. Right away, no, God is, doesn't sing Greek meter. No, oh, yes, he does. And they struggled. Here was the church, hardly born, and there were some folks that said, hey, that's a good old snake. And we don't want to get rid of it. But you see, God has demonstrated throughout history. He very often chooses new forms as he continues to lead his people. Nothing wrong with the good old ways. Nothing wrong with the snakes, so to speak, until they go bad. They become bad old snakes. And if and when they do, they have to be destroyed. End of the fourth century, we follow it through history. There were some folks who said, hey, Greek meter, Greek meter is all right. Oh, let's do music to Roman marching tunes. I mean, that's what people are listening to. That's what they whistle. That's what they like to hear. No. God's into Greek meter. He doesn't like Roman marching songs. It just keeps on going. You see, an idol is anything that hinders or even prevents God from doing new things in people's lives. Idols get in the way. It's their nature. But God won't be satisfied with second place. Flip the calendar with me. Fast forward to the 18th century. In the early 1700s, two men came along by the name of John and Charles Wesley. And they brought something new from God, or God brought something new through them. There was a great revival. There was evangelistic, enthusiastic preaching. And that was new. See, the followers of Wesley would meet out in the fields where the coal miners were. But people in the churches were worshiping their snakes. And they didn't want enthusiastic preaching in their church. They were worshiping their worship. God was out in the fields with the Wesleys and the coal miners and the snakes were in the church. You see, good things gone bad and then worshipped. And many churches in England missed the move of God. Go, to, go with me to this country. Jonathan Edwards, that Puritan preacher in the 1732 to 1744, and his sidekick, 
George Whitfield. They had a great move of God, powerful preaching, dealing with sin, drawing near to God. You'd think those churches in New England said, wow, how wonderful. God is doing something new and great. No, there was polarizing that took place. Camps emerged. There were the new lights and the old lights. The new lights were in that spirit of revival. Anything, God, anything. And the old lights said, oh, no. We don't want that enthusiasm and emotion in our church that we have to do things decently and in order. And the result, God moved. And there was a great awakening. But there were churches in New England that didn't wake up. You see, dead and dying churches hold on to old, dead snakes. Bad snakes. You see, if God is going to do something new, He's likely to pick up a new form. And if we go to, and we decide to go with God and hold on to the old snake, then we get left with the old snake. And that snake then becomes more important than God. And the only thing we can do is get rid of it. We've got to destroy it. God will not share first place with anything or anyone. And why? Not because he has an inferiority complex, but because he loves us. And idols get in the way so we come to becoming aware or being beware of God and good things that have gone bad today today you've been with me at the Old Testament through history now we come to today and you know this phenomenon still lurks among us unfortunately they always will We are prone to wander. We are prone to leave the God we love. And that's because, you see, friends, we're made in the image of God, but we're impaired. We're irresistibly religious. We worship something. All of us, every one of us, worship someone or something. The trouble is we're impaired, and we get that mixed up. We start worshiping the wrong thing. idols today you see it happens very subtly it's I see something that works for somebody else and I'm having a bad time in my life so I'm going to give it a try I experiment and sure enough it starts to work for me on the out on at least on the surface and then I begin to give it too much oxygen I feed it too much I give it too much attention I start to align myself with it and its benefits and I give it more significance than it deserves or was ever intended to have and pretty soon what started out as a good thing as a gift from God that I should give thanks for it becomes bad when I idolize it and when it gets more attention than God does The trick is to learn to worship the right thing, the right person, which brings me to a remedy for idolatry in the 21st century for Christians. This remedy will help you avoid idolatry in your life it will also help you get rid of idols if there's one in your life now that you can identify john chapter 3 verse 14 and 15 gives us the glimpse of it just as moses lifted up the snake this is jesus speaking so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him Of course, Jesus is referring to himself and the method of dying he was going to go through, the cross. You look to me, you'll be healed, you'll live. 
But I would take it a step further, friends. I would say as we continue to lift up the cross, to become more and more saturated with its truth of what God has done for us in Christ, what He's given us, what He's promised, what's coming for free, except for my faith and my loyalty. But as I continue to lift up the Christ of the cross, my love for Him becomes as a refiner's fire, and it incinerates any competitor, anything, anyone who would challenge God's rightful place in our lives. It purifies. It highlights the bad spots, the bad idols, the bad snakes, and helps us to eradicate them. Maybe it comes to breaking them into pieces. Maybe it's just reordering them and getting them back in their right place. I was talking to a gentleman after the first service, and he said, my old snake was a Corvette. He could have broken it up into pieces, but I know I said, you just get it back in its right order. Get it out of the idol category. But you see, it's the love that Christ has for us and our love for Christ that is the purifier and the refiner. Augustine said, love God and do whatever you please for the soul trained in love for God will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved. Then there's the comment by Father Arupe. He says, um, nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love with Him in a quite absolute final way. The person or thing you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, what affects everything in your life, It determines what will get you out of bed in the morning and what you do with your evenings and how you spend your weekends and what you read, who you spend time with, what breaks your heart and what brings you joy. Fall in love with Christ. Stay in love with Him. and Your love for Him will decide everything. Paul says, Dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, completing holiness out of reverence for God. And then I think of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 22 at the end, 21, excuse me, where he's on the beach and the disciples, after he rose from the dead, his disciples are out fishing. He invites them to the beach. He's cooked breakfast for them. And after they eat, he gets with Peter to make things right again because Peter's just denied him three times. And he gets in Peter's face and he says, Do you love me, Peter? Do you really love me? Do you really, really love me? Then do what I need you to do. Take care of my people. You keep going with what I got started. Let nothing come between us. Back in September, I took my grandson, Luke, or uh, Jack, 13 years old to an Indians game, or Guardians game, excuse me. <laughs> I told him before we left, I said, Jack, and it, if Jack has an idol, it's his cell phone. 13 years old. I said, Jack, if you go to this game with me, that, that cell phone will not be seen. It will be in the glove box, it will be in your pocket. If I see that cell phone, I'm going to go Hezekiah on it. <laughs> and he goes, huh? And I said, well... You don't want to know. And he obeyed. And we had the best time. And I had to go up to him and give him a hug. And I I said, Jack, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to say that you're important to me. And what we're doing together is important to me. And I don't want a distraction of that cell phone between us. But Jesus is saying the same thing to us that he said to Peter. Do you love me? Do you really love me? Do you really, really love me? If so, let there be no sunshine between us. 
Let nothing come between us and do what I need for you to do. Enough said. Thus endeth the lesson. <laughs> Let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we yield ourselves to you today. Father, may your way have perfect sway in us. May your will be our delight. May your love be the pattern of our living. We place into your care, my, I place into your care, Father, my, my ambitions, my desires. Do with them what you will, when you will, as you will. I place into your loving care my family, my friends, my future, and care for them with a care I can never give. I confess my need to control my craving for status, my fear of obscurity, eradicate the evil, purify the good, and establish your kingdom on earth for Jesus' sake.